Let's talk VU meters, all right? VU meters, the old school style with the needle moving, have been around for a very long time. And prior to digital, that's all that was around. Once digital stuff started happening, they put those PPM meters on, which are basically sample peak meters. Now, the peak metering is helpful, just like the VU metering is helpful. And what I realized is I don't really use the VU meter, but I do the same thing on the peak meter. And this is the kind of thing where it's like mixing is so personal taste. You could like using what the VU meter looks like better for you. And some people might like using the digital peak meter better. There's not a right or wrong. It's basically like you're building a building. There's certain foundational elements that must be in place. And then as you go up, whether it's designed a certain way or another and how it gets done exactly is not always going to be the same. So let's talk a great comment because I love your comments. This is one by Audio Glengineer. He's one of the difference makers who comes through. The guy's got great stuff, great opinions. What he dropped here is, you know, these days I've been using a plain old VU meter as the very last plugin, even after my mix AB plugin. I noticed a year or so ago, if I calibrate the VU to negative 12 RMS, I can get the volume and dynamics where I want quicker than I can with LUFs. I noticed this one day when I started comparing my mix to reference mixes through the VU meter. So many pro mixes hover around negative 10 to negative 12 dB RMS and hit about 3 dB higher on the kicks and snares. It sounds stupid simple, but it works worth a try. So this is one of these things where that might be a very valid way to judge how your mix is doing compared to other stuff. In general, if you're going to reference mixes, try to get the volumes level first between the reference mix and your mix. Even if that's as simple as just playing it, hearing how it's perceived to you, and then setting your master fader to match whatever it is that you're hearing. Because a lot of people take like a loop back from Spotify or something just to be able to hear what's happening, you know, with real reference stuff. And then they're throwing on, you know, the back and forth between their mix. So you don't even really need the Mix AB plugin to do that. And, you know, I've done that many, many times. But it's very important to get the levels right. So pick something that you want to match, like the kicks or something. Get that like the same, just so you can get a sense of what's happening back and forth at the same level, because otherwise you'll be tricked. But what he's saying is put the VU meter as the very last plugin, you know, instead of a LUFS meter, essentially. So whatever your very last plugin is, maybe you have a limiter last on your mix bus or master bus, whatever we call it, the last final boss bus. You got a VU meter there? Maybe you're looking at that. And you're basically see, trying to see what he's saying. Now, there's there's something I want to add to this. First, I don't do this. It doesn't make it right or wrong. I'm just not super scientific about how I go about mixing or mastering. I don't do a lot of research on what other tracks exactly are hitting on the, the meters in order to get mine that way. It's just not something I do. Maybe I'm just lazy. But it, I'd rather spend the time doing other things. I You know... I don't know if that's necessarily a way that you need to do it, but it's, this is what he does, so I'm sure it's okay because this dude knows what he's talking about. So what you got to basically look at, in my opinion, and this is something I want everyone to understand. I'm going to show you what a VU meter is so that we can kind of talk about why, like why I was, what I was saying before about how I basically use this in my own way on this, and you can do the same thing. So like this VU meter here, right? This is a standard Waves VU meter. Um, it came with something I got, I think, because I don't, I never bought it, but it was just part of my plug-in bundle or something that I picked up. So anyway, um, when you look at this meter, what I want you to understand, and this is the critical stuff, is any VU meter takes 300 milliseconds approximately to get this needle up to wherever it hears something. So that means when it hears a, a peak of any kind, like you hit a snare, it's going to take 300 milliseconds for it to rise up. And it's going to take about 300 milliseconds for it to fall. Now, it sounds like I'm just throwing milliseconds at you. But what you should realize is that's a third of a second. So that's actually a long time. In other words, the peak meter that we're used to, the sample peak meter down here, you know, which shows dB full scale at zero, that's how you know what kind of meter it is. Because you see the zero at the top? Nothing can get above zero. Zero dB full scale means on a full scale, zero is the top. All right, now that's why zero is at the top. And when you look at this, what you'll notice 
okay, is that this moves very fast. This moves slower. So just by the ne the fact that the needle moves slower up and down means you're getting a an, an average. It means it's not the exact second that things are happening that you're looking at. You're actually looking at this average because of the rise and fall time that must occur when you have an analog needle like this moving, all right? And I'm talking about, you know, digital needle, but an analog VU meter style. It takes time. So it actually gives you a better understanding of the perceived volume because we don't hear things in that quick of a, of a way anyway. It's actually very similar to the way uh, film works. We, you can work at like 24 frames a second, 30 frames a second. You can work at those sort of frame rates because the way the human eye works, it, it holds on to an image for like a little bit before the next one needs to process. That's why with flip books, for example, it looks like we're, it's moving even though there's that time happening in between because we can see, you know, our image, the image holds in our eye, and it's very similar to this. The sound holds in our ear a little bit. So just by having that needle moving slower, this is way more true to the way we hear than a peak meter, okay? So just keeping this stuff in mind, these general principles, what you'll realize is the things that you're going to be metering that have the most steady sound, like you know, a synth, let's say you played a synth and you just hit one note. That one note holding is consistent, right? So because it's consistent, assuming there's nothing oscillating and changing and moving the filter envelope around while it's playing, assuming not that, it's just a steady sound. What you'll notice is this actually becomes very accurate because the average is accurate. In other words, it'll get up to where it needs to be and it won't be moving much. So it'll hold at a relatively accurate point. And that's actually true to where it is. But when you get something very dynamic, like drums with a snare, with kick sounds, snare sounds, or vocals that are sporadic, that are talking, you know, here and there, and then they get low, and then they get loud, and they're fast, and they're slow, it becomes much harder to get an accurate reading on here. So a lot of times, it's not going to, it's not grabbing those loud peaks, like no matter what, but a lot of times you can't use it as well to determine exactly the volume of things like that, because there are aggressive transients that are very fast. So this doesn't work that well for that, but it can work well if you're using it in the way he's using it, which is like on an approximation level, you know, everything hits around negative 12 and the kicks and snares a little above that, you know, okay, like you can maybe do that, but let me show you what I do. So if you look down here, you see this thing right here, this, the way I've always worked is going to coincide with this just sort of naturally. You know, as soon as you play your track back and you're looking at this meter, okay, about halfway up, you notice how the green is solid green and then it gets to a lighter green. So it's warning you as it gets that lighter green that it's getting up towards the top of the metering. But what you'll notice is look at where this is hovering, where I have it set. The, I've always been taught to set it about halfway and it can climb up to about three quarters of the way at most. It should not get beyond that. Now, that's when you're recording or when you're mixing at the clip level. In other words, the, the beginning level before you've hit plugins of any kind, this thing needs to be between halfway and three quarters of the way. Now, when I say I'm not super scientific about it, I don't meticulously sit there to the DB and get it exactly right. You know, I don't do that. I just look at it and try to get it halfway to three quarters of the way. And then I rock, I move on. All right, so point is once this thing is here, approximately halfway to three quarters of the way. I want you to notice where the numbers are. So on a dB full scale meter, you see the 20 and you see the 15. It's hovering roughly around negative 18, maybe negative 14. Uh, like sometimes it gets above that 15 mark, but most of the time, look, negative 15 to 20. See that? It's right roughly in the middle. What is that? 18, 17. Now what you'll notice on a VU meter, check it out. You got headroom, 18. Now, most people will tell you set your VU meter with 18 dBs of headroom. Now, you can change this, but all this means 18 dBs of, head, dBs of headroom. Zero right here is the zero mark. This is not clipping This is because this is not a full-scale meter. What this is, is means zero right here. When you have 18 dB of headroom, it means this is actually negative 18 dB on a full scale meter. That's what that means. So in other words, you've got 18 more dB to go before you clip. 
That's what that means. And if you change this headroom to something else like 14, which you could do just by typing it in, type in whatever you want, that means that this meter then becomes 14 dB before you hit the 0 dB FS, which is the clip zone. As soon as you get into that clip zone, you know, with if you had 14 dB this way, this zero means it's at negative 14 dB. So if, it's, if you notice, it's exactly the same thing as I'm doing here using the dB full scale me meter, except this is moving quicker, so it's a little more accurate. So it makes it where this is taking an average because this is, you know, your VU on, which is basically RMS, and this thing is not. This is your peak, your sample peak meter, basically, and that will be a little quicker. Because it's quicker moving, you actually get a better sense of where you are, but it's the same thing. So a lot of people will tell you to keep this at 18 because that allows enough room. So just a history for a real quick second, because I'm not a huge history fan, but it, it pays to know certain things. Whereas the zero is, the reason this VU is set up this way is because this allowed engineers in the day, back in the day, to get stuff where the noise floor wasn't very close to where the signal is and it also wasn't clipping in other words they needed to avoid clipping because if it clipped it distorted and it wasn't good they also needed to keep the signal loud enough where it wasn't so close close to the noise floor that it would be actually getting that hiss and that grime and that grossness from all the the, the noise created by the gear so they needed to have more signal than noise and this let them know they got plenty of headroom so it's okay if things you know change in volume pretty drastically they won't clip if they stayed at zero so they aimed for zero so that's why this is built like this and this is doesn't need to go to 18 even though they have it set at headroom 18 because the goal with this was never to let it get up and just pin pin against three in other words if it if your needle's pinning against the three you got no idea how loud it's really going because this doesn't go farther than that but that was okay because nobody needed to get as close to zero as they possibly could. They were just trying to get the stuff to be loud enough to not have that noise on it, so the very apparent noise loud enough so it wasn't there, and also low enough to not clip. So that's the importance of understanding what this is and the, the different headroom numbers. It's not changing your sound at all when you change headroom. It's just changing what zero means. Zero either means negative 18 dB or it means negative 14 dB if you change this to 14, or it means negative 10 dB if you change this to 10. That's all it means. So let's just realize that this is all the same stuff. There's no right way or wrong way to do stuff, but here's one other tip that I think is gonna be very helpful for you guys. When you're using a compressor or a, a, any sort of limiter compressor, something like that, a lot of them, not all, but a lot, have the, the setting differential between RMS and peak. You have the ability to switch between peak or RMS. Something to note, like on my master bus processor, I have a peak button, all right? I have a, a, an RMS button. What I've always found, and you'll see this on plugins too, it's not just this, that's what I'm saying. When you see that, you should realize that RMS is giving you the average, which is a way more musical way to deal with the compression or the limiting or whatever it's doing like it's a way more natural way because it's not grabbing it's not viewing those peaks as something that they need to grab very quickly and clamp down on so it becomes a much more musical way of compressing things it's just easier to understand um, that the music sort of gets to live when it's RMS, whereas the other way, it's a much more aggressive style of compression or limiting. So on my master bus processor, when I have peak engaged, it's only good for certain things. Like if I'm doing an interview or a podcast or something where I need the peak to be grabbed, you know, and not exceed a certain point, and then it's okay. But if I'm music making, if I'm mixing, if I'm producing, and I'm running through that thing, it stays on RMS, it lives on RMS, because that is a way better way that this thing sounds when I'm trying to mix music. When I'm mixing, mastering, anything with music, RMS is the way to go. Because as soon as I flip it to peak, it actually changes the attack time to a super fast style attack that clamps down very quick on the transients. And that's not as good 
I don't want that. I want my meter and I want the unit to be working in a musical way so that it's just n very natural sounding to the ear, more subtle in a way. And that means RMS on the jam. Click RMS, all right? So when you got a compressor that shows you peak or RMS, some of them have blend knobs. I saw that's on the Steinberg compressor. There's a blend knob. Erring towards RMS is the goal when, I'm, when I see that blend knob, unless I want to maybe, you know, d double them up, maybe take the peaks off of the vocals, and then after it put RMS on to sort of give it a more net, gentle sounding something, maybe I would do it in that way. But most of the time, RMS is just a way better way to deal with it. All right. That's my opinion. It's kind of similar if you use it in that way to doing something like, you know, an 1176 and a two way you know, boom, boom. It's if you're taking peaks off and then you want a musical sound and compression. So like no right way, no wrong way, just my opinion on stuff. And if it was me and I'm especially on anything, you know, two bus, mix bus, master bus, final boss bus, go with RMS. You'll thank me. Trust me about that. All right. So do your thing. I hope you dig it. Throw something in the comments, hit the like button, subscribe if you haven't already. Evan Jaffe, Custom Cut Studios. You guys got this. Take it easy.